This is how we go on now. We'll be in till 12 o'clock today. <laughs> Hello and welcome again. This is episode 8 of the Paul Ryder Tapes. As we all know, Paul tragically passed away in July of 2022, but in the months leading up to his death, he sat down with me, his ex-wife, Angela Smith, to tell his complete life story for the very first time. We had no idea that he was about to die and we finished recording his story just 12 days before he passed away. Coming up in this episode. The very next day, I drove to Sean's house and said, give me some heroin. I want that painkiller. We've literally got like 30 minutes before it goes dark. We've got to make the video. And we're obviously not going to do the one in the mountains, but the hotel we were all staying at had this huge hotel sign on the roof. And it was beautiful. And the sun was going down. So we literally dragged them up. I went with the roses for two reasons. One, because I'd known them longer. And also because I was on stage <laughs> uh, doing something, so it was a bit of ego thrown in there as well. Was that Wembley? I'll oh, never forget Wembley. Oh, I don't think I spoke to him for a month after oh, that. Oh, why not? It's a save you can remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> and I, I think it's quite <laughs> true. <laughs> it took another couple of years for the rave scene to really catch on over here. And when it did, it did. It went huge, it went massive. Yeah, a couple of years after our, our visit to um, to Capitol Studios and these clubs that the, uh, that, that the Scousers and the Cotneys was putting on, yeah. um, I remember being at home and watching it on the news, this big scene in, in LA and, and other parts of America that was known as the rave scene. So do you think you, you were partly responsible for that blowing up? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just like we was in England. <laughs> I don't know if we was responsible, but that was the early days of it. That's how it started. So the biggest hit from Pills and Thrills was Step On, wasn't it? And uh, the video is just amazing, done by the Bailey Brothers. But mm -hmm. apparently the original plan for it was completely different to what actually happened. Step On was meant to be the first one where we actually, you know, kind of went in, because, like, Sean was really into like movies and stuff and he was like why don't we do a spaghetti western and we were like yeah okay yeah you know kind of sounds interesting so we went out to Sitges in Spain um me and Keith and we scouted loads of locations in the mountains oh this is where we're going to film it and stuff um but the problem was that they were on a European tour and they'd completely gone missing so when we left Manchester, nobody had heard of them, nobody would get hold of Nathan, nobody had heard what was happening with the bus. I suppose it was probably very early mobile phones, if at all. So they'd literally gone AWOL, there was a gig they hadn't turned up to, nobody knew where the fuck they were. Um, so we went out on, I think, the Friday, waited all day, Saturday, still nobody had heard of them. Sunday, nobody had heard of them. We had a, we had a cameraman over from Granada TV, who was a really good cameraman, David Odd. Um, with his assistant. So we were thinking, we've, this is completely blown, nobody's heard of them, we're going to have to send them home, you're going to have to go home tomorrow, we'll wait around, see if they turn up. Because they had a gig in Barcelona, I think on the Monday night or something. Um, so they had to turn up at some point if they were going to make the Barcelona gig. And then literally about five o'clock on the Sunday evening, the coach rolled up with no warning whatsoever at the hotel, and they all got off like they just, you know, they didn't know where they were, didn't know where they'd been. It was all like, you know, where's the drugs? You know, literally kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Um, anyway, so we were going, well, we've literally got like 30 minutes before it goes dark. We've got to make the video. And we're obviously not going to do the one in the mountains, but the hotel we were all staying at had this huge hotel sign on the roof. And it was beautiful. And the sun was going down. So we literally dragged them up to the top floor dragged them up onto the roof and started filming. It was like, it was that quick. Bez had disappeared to get food. So he, come, he came back with like burgers, which everybody was just like chowing down on, everybody's spliffing up. And it wasn't really, 
it was just them on a roof, literally relaxing after having gone here well, here well for about three days, and the sun set, and we got shown on the E, and became the enemy cover, and so it all turned out nicely in the end. But it wasn't a spaghetti western like we originally thought it might be. And that wasn't the only thing that didn't go according to plan for the band in Barcelona. And the gig at the ball ring, there was balls underneath the arena because that's where they did the, the ball thing, I don't know. And um, they set the stage up. Derek was very lucky because he got the lighting rig fell down, the whole stage collapsed because of the weight. It's one of those, one of those, was, did that really happen or was it just a bad nightmare? <laughs> Good thing, really, it did it before we went on. <laughs> There's no health and safety then. <laughs> Do you think ecstasy had its benefits for the arts? Mm, yeah, definitely. Talk about it. It helped me. It helped me. To, to, uh, you know, it was used in the, I think it was the 1950s, as, as marriage therapy. Yeah. And they used it to... Uh, Heal marriages. I'm yeah. sure they healed a lot of marriages with it. And I think it's been used in PTSD treatment for veterans yeah. as well. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Once, a bit like Ibogaine. Right, we're coming to that. That's, <laughs> gonna be, that's probably a whole episode in itself. To be continued. Yeah, Ibogaine's a really important part of your story, um, but that's definitely a separate discussion from ecstasy. Anyway, e ecstasy really did influence Pills and Thrills, that's for sure. But before you recorded Pills and Thrills, you did a tour of America, didn't you? And I remember you telling me that Andy Hardy went with you. It was just hedonistic days of going to different places, um, going for drinks afterwards, and always people come backstage. And I remember a great couple of people from the Grateful Dead came backstage, can't remember where it was, and then gave everyone some acid. And then we just all got off our heads on acid and just ended up in the back of a um the back of a van with a kind of big hole in the roof, just dry I can't even remember where it was, just driving around some city in America, all hanging out the back of this roof, just laughing our heads off. Just mental times, you know what I mean? Just driving up and down freeways, down roads, all just kind of dancing along and singing along in this wagon. It was hilarious. The best of times. That whole experience, you no know, being in America, soaring, and the and it, it was leading up to uh, going to LA to record the album, and we just had the most amazing sound. And Bez soon made his mark when they arrived in LA. So we used to drive there every day. I remember was arriving the first day, and there's a traffic jam leading off the motorway, and there's a, someone up front arguing with these these builders and it was a big fight and we pulled off eventually get to the studio and then half hour later Bess comes running in hide the car hide the car I've just got into a fight on the motorway like Christ I've only been here a day my my, my recollection is also quite faded you know it's not the best at times well, I said to the guy who'd been in the studio before and he said uh, I want to dance with somebody that was a big hit at the time wasn't it I said, when you used to have been in I said, oh, that must have been boring, but because he was like this, and he went, oh, no, it was crazy. He told us all these stories, and we were like, nah, we thought he was being sarcastic. How little did we know? Well, Paul Gokafo's nice. Steve Osborne was like the tall, skinny guy. He had, like, big eyes and, like, a nervous twitch, and because he had these big eyes, Paul called him Yikes. Paul named him Yikes. It's the same if you remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> and I, I think it's quite true. <laughs> I remember Paul spending, I remember even one day he was in the jacuzzi, which was at ground level. He said, have you got a light, guys? I went, no, and I'd been out all day, come back, and he went, have you got a light? I went, your room's there, have you not got out? He went, nah, just be getting lights off people going past. Okay, so when you were in LA, there was a significant um, life change that you made when you were in LA. Oh. Do you not remember? You got married. Oh, oh yeah. Not to got, me either. <laughs> I got married. Okay, so let's let's go. Let's talk a bit about your personal life. So when I met you in Iceland, mm -hmm. you told me that you uh, were separated from the mother of your one child, mm -hmm. and then about four months later, I opened a copy of the Face magazine, and it was your wedding photos. Oh, you got married in Calabasas. Oh god! And you had a, a small 
boy and you had a babe in arms yeah. that you'd conveniently forgotten to tell me about. That's what liars do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you've got the emotional maturity of a 14-year-old in a 21-year-old in a man's body. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, you were older than... You must have been older than that because... Oh, 20... This was like 19... Oh, 21, 2, 3... 91 or I was something. probably 24... Was I only twenty-seven then? Yeah. Moment? Wow. Yeah. So when you when you're twenty-four and you're, you you have the disease of addiction, you you stop growing emotionally at, at the age you started drinking. Yeah. And mine was eleven, not fourteen. Really. So I I had the emotional maturity of eleven-year-old. Well, that still a little still little. running around like a loony. Yeah. 24 with an 11 year old head. So tell me about your relationship with Alison, who was your first wife. Oh, yeah. Um, did we speak about this? How I met her? She was working in a shoe shop. Now, you know, I've got a thing about shoes. Yeah. I don't keep diaries, I keep jackets and shoes. I can look at any one mm -hmm. pair of my shoes and know exactly where it was, where I bought, where I bought them, and when I bought them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I lost them all in the fire last year. Yeah. Um, so my memories of uh, my memories have kind of disappeared because I can't look at the shoes and remember. So she was working in a shoe shop, which I found I found pretty cool, um, selling kickers and pods. These, these are shoes, by the way, in case you've never heard of them. Uh, both French. Pod, oh, pods are Italian, maybe. But well, kickers are French. Um, and I walked in there and I said, do you want to come out tonight? And she gave me a number. Now, weren't you engaged to Stephanie at this point? I was engaged to Stephanie at this point. Oh, Paul. I know, I'm just a rascal. Yeah. I'm terrible. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, You're I had 11. a 12-year-old, 11-year-old head. Good excuse. <laughs> So yeah, the, the engagement was off and Alison was on and uh, I always said I wanted to get married in California and it was a perfect opportunity while we was there for a good few weeks. How long had you been together at this point because you had two children? Yeah, quite probably about three years. Mm -hmm. About three years we had a house together, we bought my first house. Were you in love? No. I wasn't, in, I wasn't in love with anyone or anything. I was in love with music. That okay. came first. Mm -hmm. You know, rehearsals came before anything. And what was your relationship like with Alison when you had your kids? And oh, it was great. So tell me about your decision to get married then. What prompted you to go, right, I'm going to get married right now? Simply because I was in Los Angeles. Yeah. That was the main thing. And did you propose to her? What happened? Um, I said, do you want to, do you want to get married? Because she, she was over here with you, was she? No, no, she was in England. Yeah. I said, get on a plane with Linda, my mum. My dad was over here working with us. Yeah. I said, get on a plane, we'll get married. And your mum travelled to America with Mark's wife, Jane, didn't she? We had to fly to Chicago and then from Chicago to L.A., and we're getting off the plane and they're saying, have you anything to declare? I have never seen, I don't know if I can say this or not, but great big men and women with guns and what have you. And Jane had an apple in her bag. Oh, they went mental. They marched us off at gunpoint to this blooming warehouse with plants and all sorts in. and I said excuse me can't she just eat it were you missing her is that why you wanted to get married um I must have been I must mm. have been yeah mm. yeah and so did you ever think oh my god what have I done I'm getting married or were you totally up for it no I was totally up for it the sun was shining it was bright sunny California weather, yeah. everything was good. Yeah. The album was coming along nicely. Right. Let's get married. So, do you remember the wedding day? Do you remember what happened? Yeah, it was in Calabasas. And um, it was back in the day when Calabasas was still fields. Mm. 
You remember when we moved there? And mm. it took it took me six months to find the place I got married in because it had all been built up. Yeah. With with supermarkets and houses, new housing estates. I just couldn't find the place, and then I found it after six months of looking. But yeah, I remember the day. It was great. Oh dear, Gary. I think he overslept. Well, I didn't go, did I? Because we was waiting to go, so we was, we was ready to leave to go up to the hills to get married in Calabasas, we didn't know. And uh, me and PD were in a room, so they said, we'll send, we'll come up and knock on the door, we're ready to leave. So I mean, PD sat there like, no one's come. So we walked down about half an hour late and they'd gone. And later he said, we knocked on your door, he didn't answer. So Paul was a bit upset, obviously. And then about a year later, we talked about it. Bez, he sent Bez up, he sent Bez up to come and get us. And Bez went, yeah, you were in the first block right there. We went, no, we were in the second block. He's knocking on the wrong door, weren't he? Derek was supposed to be taking me. He said, oh, we can't let them just get married. We've got to have a party and this, that and the other. Factory records, I think, had made the... sent them these flowers and made them the cake, but we actually paid for the wedding and I'd bought Alison a dress. What happened? We went back to um, Oakwood Apartments in Burbank uh, trash cans full of ice and full of champagne. Paul Oakenfold was DJing around the pool. Nice. And it was a great day and a great night. Yeah. Yeah, everyone had a really good time. The wedding was just, of course I come and play some music at your wedding, you know what I mean? It's like, we're friends, not a problem. So after they'd finished recording Pills and Thrills in LA, Rowetta then had to go and put her vocals on. Recording at Eden in Chiswick, we lived in apartments across the road from the studio and we just hung round together all the time. We ate together, stayed up together, drank together, everything. Um, the ones who did drugs did drugs together. But um, yeah, we were there, <laughs> probably why. Actually, we didn't really, it was more laughter then and funny banter arguments. There were arguments, but it wasn't, it didn't feel serious then. Um, it felt like it was just, we just laughed all the time. So then you went home. Mm hmm Pills and Thrills got released. Mm hmm you then did a tour, a British tour, I think, straight after that to promote the album, is that right? It sounds about right, yeah. yeah. And in the early days, one of their crew was the legendary Cressa, who ended up dancing with the Roses. He has really fond memories of Paul, who he refers to by his nickname of Horse. Yeah, Horse, and we just got on from the, from the off. I mean, it was, it was Paul that first said to me, jump, on the, jump in the van, you know, to come to a gig. Which was like, which was great. I mean, the first two times, I got stood up. <laughs> I went and waited outside the boardwalk for about two hours, and oh, they must have already gone. <laughs> I went all the way up to Swinton one time on a bus and waited there. And thought, They're not coming, are they? <laughs> but the third time, I got in because it was a transit van in them days. You know, it was it was, you know, it's proper basic. And that once, the first time I got in the back of the van with them, that was it. I was there for every gig after that. And it was Horse that said, you know, come on, Chris. <laughs> Tell me about him in those early days. He was a little bit in shadow of Sean, obviously, because Sean has his massive character and ego. But Horse had his own uh, personality as well. You know, he wasn't... He wasn't trying to copy, he wasn't in any way mimicking Sean or, any, you know, he, he was his own man. And, you know, he had his own his own definite ideas about music and style and everything. I mean, that first album that they did, his bass playing is just, ah, oh, oh. For me, that's the Mondays, is the first album that 24 Hour Party People Positive Hate Can't Smile Like Out. That, for me, is, that that's, the Mondays for me because that was when I was in the back of the van with them. Dingwall in Camden, nineteen eighty, early eighty six. There was a there's a McDonald's around the corner, and uh, we've gone around there and got a cup of coffee each. Gone upstairs, uh, put a gram of whiz each in our cups, drank that. So after that, every time we did a gig, it was like, Chris, we're going for a spicy brew. All right, then, yeah, let's find a McDonald's. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the joke. Then every time after his sound, once he'd done his sound check, Chris, spicy brew. Come on, then, I'm coming then. <laughs> Some of the band were reluctant to let their parents see them play live. 
well, the first one we they said, no, we don't want my mum to come yet. We're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were funny like yeah. that, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. They, we don't want her yeah. to come. With, and I was going mad. I said, oh, it's very good. Everybody else can go and yeah. see them. But I can't go and see yeah. them. So Derek said, don't say. Oh, and that night, he'd come round, Sean, um, with this pink Lacoste T-shirt. I want to wear this tonight. Can you wash it and have it dry? And it was still, it was still damp. And uh, he wore this pink T-shirt and Derek smuggled me in and I'm at the back. So, well, they won't <laughs> see me anyway. They can't see me. And uh, they were playing away. And then I'll never forget, Sean just mouthed, Hello, ma'am. <laughs> I love you. It's dry. Oh, no, he probably deny this because I've got this memory oh, yeah, in it. Yeah. PD also told his parents not to go to the Manchester show, but his dad ignored him. I stayed in the Midland Hotel and I was looking out the window of the kids and girls going to the show. I spotted my dad in the crowd. I spotted my dad from four floors up because I didn't want him to go and he bought himself a ticket off a tout. So I was like, wow, you know, hometown gig. And that was the night when the rock and roll mums realised that their sons had finally made it. Well, I, I remember when they were on the MEN. This always sticks in, <laughs> this always sticks in my mind, really. And um, we were going to the concert and we were going to stay mm -hmm. backstage upstairs, weren't we, anyhow? And I, <laughs> I mean, it must have been a bit thick. I don't know, I've rubbed myself down as thick in that way, but anyhow. We were going and we were on Chapel Street and oh, the traffic jam. Oh, Remember? I did. What's oh, going on here? The traffic jam, mm. it was terrible. I first started out in the back of the bus with the Mondays. And then after a time, in fact, it was after Finsbury Park in, it must have been 86. It was a factory do with uh, ACR, New Order and the Railway Children. <laughs> um the manager at the time, Phil Sachs, said, Cref, because he had a bit of a lift, Cref, you're always in the van. Why don't you help Horthman and set everything up and we'll pay you £20 a show? I said, all right, Phil. And so that's how I got into rodeoing. And we couldn't move and... We were and stuck I, in this traffic jam. I, I said to Ken, I don't know who else we had in the car, but the car, it might have been my mum and dad, but the car was full. It might have been Jason and Jill. I don't know, anyhow, it doesn't matter, does it? And I went, God, the police on were out there. on horses. Yeah. The yeah. crowds were that I bad. Said, you know, there's somebody really famous on the yeah. MEN. What that, are you doing? That's exactly. And Ken said to me, Are you potty or what? Why? And mm. he went, well, That's where the lads are. I, I know. Never. And that's when it dawned on me then that, it, yeah, um, they made it. Yeah. Um, and then the John and Ian, who was my other pals with roses, Said, oh, well, if you, you know, work for us, oh, okay, boom, boom, boom. If you're doing that, do this, boom, boom, boom. But then it came to the point where there were conflicting shows. And I yeah. was absolutely gobsmacked. Yeah. And I was on my own and thinking, oh, what's going on here? What, you know, something yeah. Yeah. tragic's oh, happened yeah. Yeah. because the, of the crowds yeah, and what the have you. Oh. And then I had to, I was told to go to such a door and knock on the door and all these people started following me to this door and I was swamped by a crowd and it was quite frightening really. So I had to make a decision and um, as much as it hurt me, I went with the roses for two reasons. One because I'd known them longer and also because I was on stage <laughs> uh, doing something, so yeah, it was a bit of ego thrown in there as well. And I know it's on your own, did you? Yeah, because Derek was it already was? there. Yeah, of course he was, but why didn't you come with us then? I, I don't wonder. know. No? Um, and I'd knocked on this door and all these crowds were surrounding me and somebody said, that's his mother, that's oh, the mother. Okay. 
and I was quite frightened actually. Yeah. And the man on the other side of the door said, "Oh, you'll have to wait there while I check up on you, love." And uh, he went to get somebody else, and somebody else came, and they opened the door and literally grabbed me in. Yeah. We were in Leeds, and I've said, "Sean, I'm not going to be at the next show." And you're a traitor, Chris. You're a traitor. Well, as I got off and got in the car to drive off, Bez and Horse was like, all right, see you later, Chris. See you later, mate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought, this is not right. Like it's like it, something you know. out of another world. I know. But Sean came round in there. He was a bit upset that, yeah. you know. But, hey, I had to make a I couldn't be in two places at once. Describe what you were doing with the roses on stage. Dancing like a berserk thing. So you were like oh their, you were like their bears, really, weren't you? Yeah, with better moves, man. Better moves. Come on, come on. <laughs> to this day, we've had this conversation, Bez and I, and I think he defers to me in the end. <laughs> I remember seeing you at Wembley Arena when I was when I was at still at MTV. I think. All oh, right. I'll never forget when oh, I, I don't think I spoke to him for a month after oh. that. Derek was stoned out of his head. He'd been drinking. Well, I mean, drinking. He was flat out on that flight case. I know he was. Even the, everybody had gone home. Even the riggers had pulled everything down. Oh, and I was still... But he was celebrating. shivering in Wembley. When you were all back, we went back. We should have come back with us, shouldn't we? At the um, hotel, oh, we were with. all oh. drinking and oh. marrying. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. we nice, mum and dad. Oh, well, that nice. is another had... story. That is another story. Oh, didn't we have some? Then, luckily, oh. I didn't because they were saying, "Oh, phone the hotel," but I didn't know the dining code or anything. Luckily, Ben. Now, do you remember Ben? Oh, I do. You was in love ben. with Ben. Oh, Ben was wonderful. Oh, Ben came back for me he and took me, yeah, he was, took yeah. me back to the hotel. Yeah. And well, it was Derek then. Oh, he was with me. Oh, he was unconscious. But he wanted a drink of Derek. That's no, why he was, he was so celebrating. He was so proud. Yeah. He worked so yeah. hard. And yeah. oh, he was flat out unconscious. Ben yeah. got him up to the bedroom, oh, yeah. and I it? just sat in the bedroom. I was freezing. Oh. I didn't go downstairs to you. I rang for room service. Yeah, but he should have done. He should have settled him in bed and then come down to us. He deserved that to have a good drink. I never relax. spoke to him for a month. When the arena show wasn't that great, I remember it wasn't. Mm. I don't know, and I think with hindsight you said Sean wasn't on form. Yeah, I think he was pressing the uh, pressing his sabotage button again. What does that mean? Well, when you have the disease of addiction, mm. you have a built-in sabotage button. When everything's going great, you'll sabotage it because you don't feel worthy. Okay. And he had his sabotage button press. What was his using like at this point? Oh, pretty heavy. Pretty heavy with the heroin. When yeah. did he start taking heroin? Oh, I know he first took it when, when he was still at the post office. Was... When the first wave of uh, heroin addiction came round from Liverpool to Manchester. Did it take him a while to become addicted? or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he'd, yeah. he'd take it and then leave it for a months and months and months and months and then take it again but his um his full-on habit was after after we came back from la i mean it, i think it was his way of dealing with things you know when things are so good it's like you yeah. can't quite you can't get your head around it you can't get your head around it everything was great everything was fine and he he, he has a sabotage button I have a theory about why a lot of very successful musicians end up being addicts. Mm. And I think, tell me what you think about this. The adrenaline rush you must get from being on stage and having tens of thousands of people all screaming for you, making you feel amazing. The come down from that must be tremendous. And I think, do you think musicians 
turn to drugs a lot because they're trying to perpe perpetuate that natural high they get. That natural high is so intense. You need something to come down. Mine was vodka. Mm. You know, I'd go, I'd get off stage and I'd drink a bottle of vodka just to come down off the adrenaline. Right. You know, and that's not normal drinking a bottle of vodka. No. You know, and Sean's happened to be heroin. Right. After the, like you say, the adrenaline rush was just yeah. so intense. And so at that point you were just doing ecstasy here and there. Yeah. Smoking. Oh no, you'd already given up smoking weed at that point. Yeah, you that was after Iceland. Iceland. Yeah. So your drug use really was mainly just alcohol rather than actual. Just drugs. alcohol until and until the uh, until the separation with Alison. Tell me about that. I remember that day. I found out she was cheating. I had a private detective follow her. How long had you been married at this point? Whew. Couple of years, I think. One year. One year. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was exactly <laughs> nearly one year to the day. Yeah. Yeah. So, what were the first signs that she was cheating? How did you know that? Um, she kept going out in the car mm. during the day, and it was like I just knew there was something going on. You just know. You just know. And to put my mind at rest, I, I got a private detective to follow her, and he. he came up trumps he said i'm outside the house now the bedroom light's gone on do you want me to sit here all night and you can pay me or do you want to call it quits i said yeah go home you've proved the point and the very next day it was painful you know the very next day i drove to sean's house and I said give me some heroin i want that painkiller what did it feel like when you took it for the first time oh it felt wonderful for a few minutes and then i puked up projectile vomit I said like, god why do you take that shit and like two hours later I was still feeling really good after puking mm. and that was the uh, that was the start of it you kind of brushed over you said it was painful how was that painful like what how did that feel Ooh, therapy session yeah um I just felt betrayed but let's be fair, you weren't exactly an angel either. Like, why is it okay for you to cheat, but it wasn't okay for her? You had, had you been faithful in the marriage? Because you weren't faithful in the relationship, clearly. No, and I wasn't faithful in the marriage. And my idea of thinking was, it's okay for me to do it, but not her. You know, what is that 11-year-old head again yeah. that doesn't really have a clue what's going on. Do you think she cheated because she knew you were cheating? Possibly. Very Tell possibly. me about the night in G-Mex. I forgot about this one. Um, when when I met you in Iceland, mm -hmm. um, for some reason I'd given you my mum's address because she only lived like six miles from you. I lived in London, but she lived six miles yeah, away. Yeah, I dropped off tickets and for you, you. You drove to my mum's house and knocked on the door and dropped off G-Mex tickets for yeah, me. yeah. So I went up with a friend, mm -hmm. expecting that I'd be seeing you. I think you gave, did you give me backstage passes? Can't remember. I think I did, yeah. I remember going to the, an, an after show kind of area mm -hmm. and I never saw you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because Alison, I'd found out later, that's because your, your wife-to-be was there. That, that's <laughs> correct, yeah. And I think you ended up, do you want to go there? What you ended up doing that night? <laughs> <laughs> with a certain female singer yeah no we can't go there no, it's not fair on it. no it's not <laughs> um so you ended up not seeing me but you ended up Seen. in bed with a female singer yeah um when you were in a relationship with alison so you can't really blame oh, no. the girl for I, I, i'm completely guilty and you told me that she'd stormed off because she knew you'd taken some ecstasy. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, she got a taxi home. Yeah. So, you know, she was probably going through a lot of trauma and pain having to deal with you. Oh, yeah, I'm certainly not innocent. Yeah. Certainly not. So, when it was the other way around and you discovered that she was cheating on you, like, what did that feel like in your body? Like, pain, where? Pain. It was How? like being stabbed in the stomach. The stomach was churning. Did you want it? 
to all be okay did you want to put it right or did you want to just leave or like how what was your initial response no it was like let's work through this oh so you wanted to try and yeah forgive yeah her and... yeah but it just didn't happen did it make you realize that you did love her more than you thought you did no i think it was just the rejection that i couldn't handle right yeah rejection's a bad one it is isn't it oh yeah it is Mm -hmm. So, heroin was the answer for you then? Yeah. Did Was that a successful resolution? Did that did that end up being a good thing? <laughs> that, that ended up being a nightmare of my life. <laughs> ended up being a complete nightmare. Yeah. It took me to dark, dark places. Places I never want to go again. And the first time we did that was we were in Cheetah Mill. In your order's rehearsal room, and uh, they had a kitchen at the back, and he went in the back kitchen to do it, and not he didn't hide it for some reason. And I walked in, and I just said, "You dick, what are you doing?" And he he looked really embarrassed, and he went, and he said, "I know." And that moment, I realised that from that on, from then on, it, the, the, the the band was on a on a doubt. You know, it was it was it was. You know, beginning of the end. Tell me how that happened. How how long did it take before you realised you were an addict? Um, for the band splitting up, the first time, the first time the band split up, like I was on a good wage. We was all on good wages. One week, and the following week there was no wages. How long after you broke up with Alison was this? Ooh. So you start you started taking heroin. This would have been in like. 1992, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and then how long before you felt like, Two, shit, three, I'm addicted four. to this? Three years of dabbling, of, of taking it every day. I remember him not being right and trying to hide it from me. I could never tell when he'd done crack. Heroin, you can tell a mile off. His, his mouth changed when he'd done heroin. He went, remember when that used to go? Yeah. yeah. His chin would go like that. It looked like it was, I said, I used to say, yeah. you got your ventriloquist chin again. I know you've scored. It's like, and he would overcompensate, wouldn't he? He would overcompensate. And it's the only time he'd ever clean the house. <laughs> a normal heroin, <laughs> a normal heroin addict. It kind of slows it. him. It would speed him up, and he'd be all happy and jolly and cleaning the house. And he denied it, and I was like, I'm sure only because the others said he had, but I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I mean, that was the only time I witnessed that. And then when the band split up, I didn't get paid for five years. Everything was frozen while we paid off a massive tax bill, which we was told our tax was up to date. You know, we were certain we was never going to get ripped off because we were streetwise. Right. And um, the, the, the suits told us the tax had been paid. So the band split up and it's like, you can't have your money, you've got to pay these debts off. So I was on my ass for five years, back on the dole. Right. We've not come to the fourth album yet, though. We're jumping ahead a little I'm bit. jumping ahead. It's way but too far. Should we so, open the door? I should just take this off. Take that, that off? Bad. No, you can take it off. Let's go deeper into are, the... Are people going to be interested in my yeah. life? Stephen, <laughs> is it interesting to talk about heroin addiction? and how? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course it is. Oh, OK. It's honest and it's raw and it's... Yeah, mm. it's really good. Um, okay, so did, what did you inject it? Did you smoke when you first took it? How did you how did you take it? I smoked it for years. For th for the three years that I was um, the band was still together, I just smoked it. Did you ever think what am I doing? I'm getting addicted to heroin here. Did you ever question it or think? No, because once you take it, it's like everything, all that shit goes away. All them troubles just go away, and you don't think about that. Well, until you need some until more. Until you need some more. And at that time, I could afford to get more. So everything was cool. And when did the rest of the band realise that you were doing it as well? I remember reading a quote from one of the band, I think it might have been Paul Davis, actually, saying that the band couldn't support two heroin addicts. Yeah. There, were, there was only one and then there suddenly were two, and that was obviously Yeah, I you. think that was my dad. 
your dad said that. I think it was, yeah. That must have been horrible for your dad to see his, both his sons Oh, yeah, it must addicts. have been terrible. Did he ever talk to you about it and say... Yeah, I, was, I did cold turkey at his house a couple of times. I remember him saying, if I could do it for you, I would. Yeah. Now, that's a man. Yeah. If I could do this cold turkey for you, I would. Yeah. Well, he couldn't. No. And once you're in it, you're in it. And so you find a way out, which isn't easy. I felt sad, you know, you've seen the kind of the rise and fall of someone. Um, you know, and that's what happens sometimes when drink and drugs gets the better of you. That's the outcome. Some people manage to put the brakes on that. Some people don't and go on and die. And some people manage to put the brakes on and slowly turn things around. And, and, and Paul slowly, again, with the support of... Um, particularly um, Derek and Linda, you know, who never judged you, Paul. You know, they supported him throughout that period of time. You know, the kids were living there as well. You know, they, they did a wonderful job. They just gave him that foundation for Paul to come through that. So you only realised that you had a problem when you suddenly couldn't afford to pay for it anymore? Or did you not realise even before that that I've got a dependency here? No, I was getting vibes off Gaz. Gaz knew and he hated it. He hated me taking heroin. Yeah. And he would hardly speak to me. It just wasn't the same before. You know, we knew then there was a couple of people in the band doing heroin and then it, it just, he was, he, he wasn't, he'd lost his, it lost being about the music and it. And I think, it, I don't know, I could, it's a long, long time ago as well. I could tell if you were at 20 yards away down the end of the drive coming yeah. towards me, I could tell if you'd used, because you have like, a kind of aura about you it's really hard to explain and of course pinned eyes and you've got very light blue eyes mm -hmm. and this kind of gray wash over your face and you always had a weird look on your face like a kind of half smile like a smile that's trying to disguise the guilt mm -hmm. Ooh, I feel sick well, I can about that. I can spot a heroin addict from half a mile away yeah they've got a, a unique walk Oh. Yeah, there's, there's a it's 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 a it's a stride that they've got, and the and just that look on the face. Yeah. You know, I've been I've been at a loss many times trying to score, and spotted somebody. Yeah. And said, "Can you get for me?" Yeah. And they said, "Yeah," and I was spot on every time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I can spot them a mile away. Yeah. I'm sure you could spot it pinned on me. Eye, pinned eyes. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can spot people in the street too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That comes with experience. Yeah. I can never tell when you've done crack, though. Oh. You used to get away with that one completely oh, right. and never okay. could tell the crack. Well, what's the sign of someone who's on crack, really? Um, well, like you said before, I, it, things have the opposite effect on me because I've done so much. Crack cocaine, I just went to sleep on it, yeah. whereas everyone else would be cleaning the house. Yeah, whereas you would, uh, uh, the other symptom of you being on heroin was yeah. that you'd suddenly start cleaning the house. Yeah, at the and you'd be effect. all like energetic and funny and yeah. and confident. Yeah, yeah. And chatty opposite. to strangers. Whereas everyone else would just Didn't gouch you? out and yeah. go to sleep for a few hours. Yeah, I mean you did your fair share of gouching out as oh, well. Oh yeah, didn't I burnt you? some holes burnt in the couch. Hole, yeah, and on yourself. And on myself, yeah. yeah. Holes in you. Oh, Shirts. gloomy times. They were awful, those times. Gloomy times. We'll talk more about those. Okay. We're jumping into the future again. So mm -hmm. um, we were at the point where you'd started taking heroin. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seemed to take your worries away. Yeah. You never, it never twigged with you. Oh, shit, I'm becoming a junkie. That never occurred to you. No, it just became everyday life. Did you not think I'm setting myself up for a... Nightmare here, no? No. No, it was just nice to get rid of those horrible feelings that I was having. At what point did your mum know what you were doing? Ooh. You know, we've never spoke about it, really. Wow. Never really spoke about it. She knew. Yeah. She knew that I knew that she knew. But right. we never really... She, she used to leave out. She was working, still working at this point, and I'd moved back into their house. Yeah. And she used to leave me my methadone out in the morning. Right. She used to have to, have to hide the bottle and yeah. just leave me the day. I remember day. hiding methadone bottles yeah. from you. I didn't lose hope, but I didn't know what to believe. I, I, 
my philosophy is just take each day as it comes live each day as it comes and accept what you've got to face she just leave me the daily dosage yeah so she was nursing at, at some point one of the articles i read online last night about you said that your mother was a nurse <laughs> no really <laughs> my personal nurse yeah no she was a nursery nurse she uh, looks after four-year-olds teacher. Yeah, teacher teaching yeah. four-year-old kids yeah. so you married your see that, that that goes back to the books yeah. With all these uh, non-truths, mm. I must read the books again, and we'll put we'll put to right some of these non-truths. Yeah, I think yeah. It, I think they all need to be redressed. Or if they? anyone has a question after this podcast, we can do a question and answer yeah. podcast. Yeah. Any questions, I will answer, okay. and I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. Okay. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a shout out to anybody. Yeah. Any any question at all? You're open to anything. Anything. Can I'm, I ask I'm gonna... something and get the truth? Oh, <laughs> I've been giving you the truth. <laughs> I'm squirming in my chair. I oh, know, I know. You're <laughs> um, okay, so your marriage broke up with Alison. Mm -hmm. So you, be, you you had a house with her, you had two kids. Mm -hmm. What were the practical implications of breaking up your marriage? Oh, God, I just wanted the kids. Yeah. And uh, eventually I got them. We went to court and she didn't turn up in court. And I got custody of them. Right. And we all moved back in uh, my parents' house in right. Salford. Which was actually a really good thing for the kids because oh, their dad yeah. was a heroin addict at this point. Yeah, yeah. I was Were you not concerned that your heroin addiction would get in the way of getting custody of your kids? Did Alison know you were a heroin addict at this point? No. Not at all. She could have used that against you in court really uh, oh, yeah. easily, couldn't yeah, she? Yeah. So the custody battle, tell me about that. Um oh god, it went on for like went on for a year. Going to court and coming out of court and getting rights to see them on certain weekends and holidays and Christmas. And then it went to the final decision and uh she didn't turn up for court. Do you know why she didn't turn up for court? No, I don't. You never, never asked, asked her. her? No. Have you spoken to her since? I've not seen her for 20 years. Do you wish that things may have turned out differently with your marriage? No regrets. No? No. 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 Do you regret I'm quite happy with my life at the moment. Right. That's the way it needs to be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I always say that I'm really grateful for all the crap that I've been through. Mm. Because without that, I wouldn't be where I am now. I, I'm with you. And and they say lessons are blessings, don't they? Yeah. You know? Lessons if we'd lived carefree, easy lives, mm -hmm. it'd probably be quite boring at this point. Yeah. It? Whereas you're full of action right now, and I've got plenty of action, yeah. word-wise. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> I was touched when I saw Linda at the funeral, actually. Because she said to me, he always spoke very highly of you, Chris. And I haven't seen, I haven't seen us for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And I, I, I was, I was in tears at that because it's oh, for fuck's sake. But the last, the, the, it, the last time I was in touch with him was a gig at the academy. And he, you know, he put me on the list and uh, I was there and I got that drunk. I thought, I'm not going to bother him going backstage. And I also thought, even if I was sober in Manchester, the backstage for a Monday's gig is just going to be chocker of dead legs and hangers on it. I don't even want to try to get in and see anyone, you know? So I just left it. So I didn't even get to see him. Lines on the mirror, lines on her face. <laughs> Eagle song that he once played me. Lines on the mirror, lines on her face. Life in the fast lane. <laughs> I was almost in tears. Fucking oh, okay, no. yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, yeah, that's the way he, yeah. Well, the horse that I knew, that was the way that he, you know, when he was playing, that's the way it was. He was, he was a real geezer. He wasn't fake. He was 100% real. But it was, you know, with, with horse, it was his laugh. 
He, he just had that, <laughs> you know, it was like a, it was almost like a cough and a laugh. It was just like a bark almost. I remember being in Glasgow with him. I <laughs> seen the journalist there. And so, uh, <laughs> so this, this journalist has said, oh, yeah, 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 you're flying to New York next week, I hear. And Bez has gone, flying ants! And us just fell about laughing. It was rolling about on the floor. Because <laughs> it was just, it was a beautiful Bez moment and it was a beautiful horse moment because he was just, he was literally, he couldn't stop laughing. And so afterwards, we'd always say, flying ants! And he, you know, we'd know, that was like one of our little, little go-to jokes. Flying ants! <laughs> oh, fuck you know. They were a massive, massive part of Manchester. Massive. They should never be, it should never be forgotten or underestimated. Coming up on next week's episode. I really didn't know how bad his problem was, even in the later years. And you know what the funny thing is? I've actually been back to Barbados on holiday. And I can't believe what a great place it is. <laughs> you used to have to look out the car window and look for police. Make sure the police aren't coming. That's terrible. How old was she then? Four. That's really, like, that's really a really extreme... I mean, like, how do you process that? It was very, very hard. And you keep on a brave face. It was just chaos, and I thought, oh, fuck, this is it. I better find a job. <laughs> We're playing out with a big arm track, Flexing, from the album Radiator, which has just been re-released. Please join our exclusive club and become a patron of the show. More details are on the website, which is paulrider.tv. And there also you'll find our shop with some really cool Paul Ryder and Big Arm merch. So check it out. And finally, if you've not already done so, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. We will be back here next week, same time, same place, for the premiere of the video version of the next episode. But if you want to listen to the next episode right now, go to any of the podcast platforms and you'll be able to do that. Thank you, of course, to our fab guests and to you all for being here. We really appreciate you. But the biggest thanks, of course, has got to go to the late, great Paul Anthony Ryder. Ha, 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 ha.